Why, hello, welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you with us. And today on the podcast, we are talking about relativism. I know we've talked about this before, but it's just a topic that just uh, is pertinent and just doesn't seem to be growing any less important. In fact, it grows more important by the day. And today is Tom's day, and so Tom is going to lead us in our conversation on the subject. But uh, before we get into it, uh, allow us to introduce ourselves because we don't assume that everybody in the world knows who we are. Uh, I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor. I serve at a church in the Pacific Northwest. I've written some books, including my latest book, In the House of Tom Bombadil. I served as a professor of philosophy for about a decade, and I've been a real estate investor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Enough about me. How about, how about you, Glenn? I'm Glenn Sunshine. I am a ministry associate at Reflections Ministries, a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, and a gratefully retired history professor. <laughs> That's history for you as well. <laughs> All right, Tom. Tom, why don't, you, why don't you introduce yourself and then just kind of launch us into the subject of the day. And just so everyone knows, I'm having some Pacific Northwest cold coffee here. This is a <laughs> frappuccino from uh, the, our beloved uh, folks at Starbucks. Not <laughs> beloved, actually, but it was, was, was it was what was in the fridge. Anyway, go ahead, Tom. <laughs> I'm Tom Price. I teach systematic theology, uh, philosophy, Christian ethics, um, religion in America, and even Christian apologetics. Uh, and I teach uh, predominantly at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Um, today's topic is relativism a topic that I think we've hit on and highlighted many times. We've talked about a lot of different uh, aspects of it, um, especially in relationship to the way in which words and language now seem to, to have a very uh, different, different way of relating to things than at other periods. Um, and we looked at it from a whole different other kind of uh, trails of philosophy, if you will. But what I want to do is get into a, a bit of the history of relativism and then it, some of the current challenges. And then maybe today we'll hint at some ways of addressing it as Christians. Um, and the reason I, I went back to this topic is because someone who is a big fan on our YouTube uh, page uh, has written and listened intently about previous episodes and he brought up a question about how should we um, understand relativism more fully and engage it as Christians. And the questions uh, that he brought up, I thought, were worth pondering. So what is relativism? Well, if you're a relativist, that would say that it's relative to what each of us think that it is. <laughs> it wouldn't have an essence if you're a true relativist. It would be relative to something, um, the person, the person in their social, economic, racial, gender, whatever context. Um, and so... I think to get a feel for what is meant by the different types of relativisms, we talk about the kind of way in which um, the emphasis in particular is on the fact that we don't have absolute truth. Um, and this, I think, is at a lot of the heart of the different types of relativisms. Um, absolute truth being that there is an ultimate reality that can be ultimately knowable in some strong sense, more than just our perspectives, more and, and then that there would be kind of ethical ramifications, that reality has a certain shape and form, and as we conform to that shape and form, we flourish and thrive. If we don't, we run up against uh, conflict and we create um, chaos and, and uh, crash, if you will. So... Relativism is kind of a break from that. And uh, what I want to do is maybe start with just a few definitions um, that float around in, in kind of discussions about this topic. And then I'll move into some of the history. And I think at that point, you can probably, you guys can jump in and, and start to help fill in the, those details. Um, but uh, in, in her book, um, Maria, let me see if I get this name right, uh, Bagramian. I'm not even going to try to uh, 
to say that too many times, but uh, I'll try to spell it out in the uh, in the notes for the show. Um, she wrote a book on relativism um, from a philosophical evaluative perspective, and I think her definitions are very helpful. Um, this is kind of a full definition, and we can come back to some simpler ones a bit later. But she says relativism is the view that cognitive, moral, and aesthetic norms, in other words, the way we think about things, the way we think things are good or bad or beautiful or ugly, um, these norms and values are dependent on social or conceptual systems, and that these underpin what we think about and how we understand these things. In other words, there is no absolute truth out there that we have access to directly. This truth is mediated through the social and all these other aspects, and because of that, we have a whole different range of interpretations and understandings of what is meant by truth, the beautiful, the good. That's what she says. <laughs> <laughs> Why should I accept that? Yes. But anyway, get, get, <laughs> but get, but I, I guess kind of getting to that is, you know, I'm being a little funny here, but uh, in order for relativists to even be, you know, able, you know, even to say what she just said, there has to be some concession that there is something that can be known yeah. it, and, and, that, and that we can at least know our limitations, you know, I, you know that kind of thing. I'm, I, I'm not sure. Um, I think that they may say there is something, but it can't be known, which is well, yeah, why everything ends up being relative, because whatever your perception is, is your reality. Yeah, I think that, you know, what you're stating, though, there, Glenn, is that in some sense, there's an affirmation of a reality, but the problem is more uh, epistemological than, uh, you know, uh, otherwise. Yeah. So in other words, there, there is a reality out there. We just don't know it. But what I was getting at was more like we can at least know that we don't know. I guess I guess that's – well, so I there's can't. a measure of truth that, that they, have to, they, have, they have to embrace in order to even say we don't know. Yeah, one, that's one. I mean, one of the things she turns to, um, and she isn't a relativist, is is that that kind of the irony that there needs to be a a, a, a solid point of reference in order for relativism to work. And I, I think that that is what you're both hinting at is that, um, yeah, in order truth. Let's put it this way. I mean, there is a kind of self stultifying aspect to claiming that all truth is relative made as an absolute claim, right? Because it does mean that even if you don't know, you know, they're, they're, that's a little different than, say, skepticism, which is skepticism, I think, is the direction that, you know, we can at least know one thing, and that's that we can't know anything, right? I mean, that, that, that kind of thing. But this is really saying, th this is, this like, the way she, she put it here, she goes, relativism is basically the view that, Right. Well, how do we know enough about reality to say that that's what that is? Um, it, it, I don't think it's – I mean, I think you would end up in skepticism eventually. But anyway, we can get, we can get back to kind of the, the way in which it's inconsistent. And actually it does – most philosophers, especially in the analytic tradition, that would be the kind of ones who look at language and the way it, it, it functions in relationship to, to claims – would say that it leads inevitably to cognitive anarchy. Um, and so most, most end up rejecting it. But the, the interesting thing is why so many in culture end up embracing it. And that's one of the things I'll be tracing here. Um, but she talks also about um, the way in which uh, another definition, um, well, be, well, before getting into the other definition, she said, despite the fact that relativism is basically dismissed in, in serious philosophy as an incoherent position and is identified with irrationalism and cognitive anarchy, yet people hold it um, outside of, of philosophy. And basically, they, she puts it this way, they hold that all our standards have a form of conventions sustained by a group of people who are ineluctably fallible, limited and historically situated, kind of, you know, the, the, you know, dead old white guys kind of thing. It's kind of the, the, that, that legacy. Um, 
The standards will be contingent achievements of the group and no higher kind of authority can really be attached to them. So relativism is one way, one way of embracing relativism or one form it takes is that we begin to think that there are no real pictures of the world that, that are true to the way the world really is in the fullest sense, that they, they tend to be conventions usually by people who have some kind of say in power. And that's why it holds sway over um, any any given group of people. And we can see the way in which politics today fight so hard to have a narrative and in, 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 in shape people. You can see a certain truth in that, <laughs> that there is a way in which those who get their hands on the levers of education and cultural formation do create a kind of uh, a, a cognitive embrace of, of certain, you know, interpretations of reality. So, so um, there is a thre- threads of truth here. Um, Maurice Mandelbaum speaks of historical rev- relativism, and maybe in a minute Glenn can talk about that, kind of what that is, which he defines as the view that no historical work grasps the nature of the past or present immediately. That whatever truth a historical work contains is relative to the conditioning processes under which it arose and can only be understood with reference to those processes. So that's kind of uh, the way that it it kind of has impacted historical studies. Um, And we we can kind of see relativism in a lot of other places. Um, we we, We talked about how it shows up in epistemological places. Um, that's how we know. So, you know, that, 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 you know, what, what you, what access from your perspective and from your shaping has to truth and in its interpretation is good for you, but don't make it binding on me. Right. Um, and, mm-hmm. and then we'll get to some of that, but then you have the metaphysical type of, of, um, relativism that that some ancient philosophies kind of underpinned, and we'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. You have historical relativism, you have kind of political or cultural relativism, moral relativism. So relativism can kind of infect just about every area in which, you know, we have some something to do with our beliefs and our actions. Yeah, I think here, Tom, one of the things that, that we see, uh, you know, as you... Uh, read from these different people, these different authors is that there's a, there's some question begging going on. There's some assumptions being made about reality that are not uh, actually supported or proven. One of those uh, assumptions is that, is that in some sense, um, the metaphysic is something that we can dismiss. So when we think about uh, metaphysics, we're talking about reality as such. And when it when it comes to the metaphysic, uh, there's another assumption that's being made, and that is that it's uh, just a passive reality and is not active in some sense. So, what we as the- theists believe is that the ultimate reality uh, that uh, we have in mind when we talk about the met- you know metaphysics is God, and that God is active, and consequently we we are open to uh, signals of transcendence. Uh, as you know, some people have described it. Uh, there are things that are going on that could kind of uh, inter, uh, sort of like a, interpose themselves or, or uh, from the outside on the world. So it's not as though it's entirely on our side of the equation. In other words, we're not just we're not the only ones who have to have the re, have the responsibility for discovering reality reality has a way of kind of introducing itself <laughs> yeah that's right it, when you, when you think when you think about it the, theologically so you know that's something that these folks have just uh assumed not to be the case that they they don't entertain these these this possibility they they basically just kind of uh assume that uh reality is in some sense passive and it's just waiting for us to to discover it. And then related to that, that we don't have the equipment to discover it, even if it were the case. And again, these are things that are not yeah. um, proven. They're just assumed. Now, one of the things that I noticed with my students is, is that frequently, now it, it, this wasn't the case as much the last few years, although COVID may have screwed that up. But one of the things that um, I, I had noticed is that 
among the students who were really engaged when I talked about what people believed, a, a truth claim that was being made by typically Christians, they got this sort of pained look on their face and said, how did they know that? <laughs> so they took everything and turned it into an epistemological question. <laughs> and their assumption is that you cannot actually know anything because people disagree. And the <laughs> fact that people disagree with each other means that you can never be sure of anything, probably with some exceptions like science and things like that, which they don't actually understand either, but that's another matter. <laughs> well, getting to that point, Glenn, of course, there's the democratic kind of bias that we have, that everybody's opinion is equally valuable, mm -hmm. that uh, there aren't people who actually are wiser than anybody else and know more than anybody else. Um, and consequently, we have to take this at, kind of at face value that because all these people disagree and we should kind of weigh all their opinions, you know, in the same, you know, equally on the same scale, then there's no way to adjudicate that. But I think this, this also gets at something that I think is kind of the moral dimension to this. I think that um, there's a kind of desire, uh, particularly with uh, just regular folks trying to get through the day. They just don't want to get bogged down. <laughs> Uh, in uh, debates that they don't feel like will have any, uh, you know, sort of positive uh, uh, outcome. Mm -hmm. In other words, they just want to, they want to go do their shopping. They want to go to work and come home. You know, they, they don't want to get into weighty matters because, you know, those matters could uh, be difficult to uh, sort of adjudicate, uh, live with disagreement concerning that kind of thing. Yeah, but I would add to that that moral relativism is a wonderful standard to live by because it means you can do pretty much anything you want to. <laughs> yeah, right. that, that, well, that's, that's the other side of it, yeah. Well, and one of the things I want to get to is kind of how these, these kind of issues, these things you're talking about now, how they started to take on a kind of point of value and focus, you know, in the, in the contemporary world. But I want to go back a little bit and kind of get, get, at some of the early roots of it. But one of the things that, that um, I find interesting is in reference to your, your, your uh, point uh, there, Chris, is something, uh, the, you know, the former uh, Pope Benedict back when he was uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, um, one, to his credit, and uh, he, along with, I guess, in the Protestant world, you'd, you'd think of maybe Francis Schaeffer, these people spent a lot of time trying to warn us about relativism. And they they saw in it not simply a a replacement kind of of, of the you know the Judeo Christian vibe, although they did see that, but they saw the dangers that were very inherent that we're just really beginning to see the fruit of. Um, and Rotzinger did a lot of heavy intellectual lifting of this issue. One could say that he spent his his well, a significant part of his academic reflection on the issue of the history of relativism, the impact of it. And so a lot of his writings focus on it. But one of the things he talked about is he talking about the way in which uh, Christianity um, functions right now in a world that is being swarmed by this. And he called it actually a dictatorship of relativism. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. his, it's his term for it. And I think that's an excellent term. And, and it, it kind of it almost sounds counterintuitive. When you think of relativism, you think that it actually is is opening up the door to all perspectives and to all insights and all forms of life. <laughs> but he's going to talk about it as actually a dictatorship. And I think we're already starting to also see that. I think Francis Schaeffer used to say, once all becomes relative and there are no more absolutes, something else becomes absolute. And that absolute we're seeing, again, is, is a particular ideology or a particular political uh, view or, you know, you were going to say something, Glenn? Yeah, it, this is going back to to that classic work of literature, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, <laughs> where the Philosopher's Guild, quote, demands rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's, that's right. That's the dictatorship of relativism right there. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and you can see how what is cre what is created there isn't the kind of Richard Rorty dream of kind of pure democracy living in, in a utopian um, celebration of, of life. It, it actually becomes conflict after conflict. And the other thing is what you do 
Well, what the West has done is it has, in a sense, absolutized the individual in particular. Um, and, and in a sense that it is almost this notion of empowerment is almost to the point of tyrannical um, when it becomes everyone competing to have their voice heard and whose voice is going to win out. I mean, it becomes it ends up in the conflict of uh, of a power conflict. Well, the interesting thing about that is that within the the umbrella of critical theory, when you go with standpoint epistemology, there is no individual viewpoint. Yes. There is only a viewpoint that is determined by the intersection of your various intersectional categories. That dictates everything about you, including what your viewpoint is and what you're going to believe and think and everything else. Yeah. So you've got a kind of weird relativism there, although they superimpose a moral value on top of it. But that's, yeah. that's up. Yeah, I think another dimension to this, and this is the one that is, uh, I think, what is really a source of consternation for a lot of people is that uh, the cultural elites uh, use uh, this whole line of thought as a kind of cover to secure their own uh, prerogatives and their own authority, uh, reinforce it. So think about it this way. So if I, if I can say I'm the party that is here to defend the interests of the weak, um, I'm pretty much in an unassailable position. Uh, I can agree. I can accrue more power uh, in that process, almost in a vampire-like a vampire -like way. Uh, and any challenge to my power is not a challenge to me as such, but uh, a challenge to the human standing of the people that I'm uh, supposedly uh, a spokesperson for or a defender of. So uh, the reason why... Uh, you are against these particular policies is because you're a white supremacist and you're a racist. Yeah. Uh, it's not because, uh, you know, this way of handling the matter is stupid <laughs> or even unjust. Any, anyone who questions uh, the, you know, the sort of the, the conduct of these cultural elites, whether we're talking about people in media or in technology or in government, whatever uh, they are, you know, uh, protected by this kind of shroud that they've put on of, uh, you know, defenders of the, of the, of the, of the weak or whatever. And it's a, it's really a weird kind of symbiotic relationship. Now, what's interesting though, is when you have people, uh, within the, these, uh, so-called, you know, uh, I guess, uh, I, uh, marginalized groups, um, who themselves are unhappy with relativism. So I, I, I see a, yeah. a growing number of, say, black Americans who are crying out against this stuff yeah. um, and are uh, and I, I even see it among, you know, certain, uh, you know, groups in the LGBTQ community, you know, who are like getting exasperated with how this stuff is sort of playing out and are calling for, you know, some some kind of standard that that. Uh, is just and is not just a sort of expression of a group's interests or the government trying to use those groups and that group's interest to secure its own power. Yeah. And a lot of that, again, is I think you're, you're pointing to the way in which this is continuously in our face challenge wise. Um, we just, you know, we saw it just, uh, well, for those of us who are anyone who's heard the kind of recent, uh, conversations going or going towards the most recent candidate for the Supreme Court when asked, you know, can you define a woman? Well, I need, you know, uh, you'll have to talk to a biologist about that. First of all, that's, a, that's, a, first of all, that is disingenuous anyway, because they won't listen to the biologist. They're listening to the, the social yeah. sciences and, and, the, and, and, the, and the right. but, but it's also sort of giving away the game because it argues that, being a woman is defined by biology. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah, means yeah, yeah. that you've got to exclude transgender, but she's trying to avoid saying that so, yeah, or yeah, implying yeah. anything like that. Well, it's, it's delicious. Fumbled it. It's delicious to have uh, liberals in the hot seat for a change because you know what happens with when some conservative justice has been nominated for the Supreme Court. There's always the questions related to abortion, you know. Yeah. Now, now we can just ask all these sort of like uh, – 
questions related to the obvious and just make these people look like fools. But anyway, yeah. Well, to- well, and secondly, I mean, it, and these are very important because I think this is what sort of Schaefer and Rotzinger were on to. I mean, when she was asked, you know, when does life begin? And her question again was, I don't know. And here's someone making decisions that have to do with life and women and on the most fundamental level. And now the ambiguity is such for these people, at least ideologically, that they can't take a position on that because it's going to automatically, well, first of all, it looks as though they're not, they're, they, if, if they give certain definitions, then they're tying themselves to, again, white supremacy or, you know, Western culture and, and the like. And so they want to, they want to shy away from giving anything definitive um, about these things. And this is, I think this is where we're seeing the consequence here. And this was, I mean, Shaver's very point in his conversations were in relationship to the Supreme Court and its decisions that have life and death consequences for, for everyone as what happens when it becomes the arbitrary becomes the absolute. Right. Um, and, and so we're, we're starting to see the conditions set up for severe ramifications, but let's go way back all the way back to some of the early days of relativism in the history of the West. Um, and I think we all know, uh, remember, uh, Protagoras, right? Well, Protagoras was around the time. It was just a bunch of wars going on at the time, and a lot of the stability that they were familiar with and he would have been familiar with was already being called into question. And, and, so, and then there were the endless debates in philosophy, which were always trying to come up with some what was the unifying background that could hold all the pieces together? You know, was it water? Was it fire? Was it, you know, some arche, um, ultimate, you know, principle from which all things come? And eventually these things, these debates just went on and on and on to where you started to get the sophists and started to say, well, you know, we're not going to resolve this. <laughs> so let's just find out how to, to basically use language, um, not referring to any kind of ultimate, but towards certain kind of purposes, which needless to say, often became sinister <laughs> um, and exploitative. Um, so anyway, Protagoras came up eventually with man is the measure of all things, basically is the one who determines what is and what is right and what isn't. And do, you remember, is do, do you remember the story behind that quote in Emerson Hall at Harvard? Are you guys familiar with that story? No. No. You know, em- Emerson Hall is the philosophy hall at Harvard, right? Yeah. So when they were when they were building that around the uh, end of 19th, 20th, uh, early 20th century, uh, that was supposed to be the uh, – statement engraved above the main entrance, <laughs> man is the measure of all things, Protagoras. But uh, back in those days, you actually had conservatives at Harvard, and one of those conservatives was uh, the president. <laughs> and he, uh, <laughs> he, 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 uh, he decided that he would leave uh, the lentil covered while it was being worked on so that no one could actually see what was being written there. And when it was uncovered, it actually was a quote from Psalms, what is man? that you are mindful of him. <laughs> so if you go to, if you go to Emerson Hall today, that's what you see on the lentil. It's not Protagoras. It's, 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 it's uh, the Psalms. <laughs> that's, that's great. That is a great, that is a great story. And, and what you see there is already the kind of the, the conflicting interpretations of, of, you know, man and being a measure. Right. Um, um, but then you have not long after uh, Xenophon, um, with the, he basically was talking about the gods and deity. And so you have a bunch of people he recognized that had different conceptions and interpretations of the gods. So basically human knowledge of this was very limited. And so, yeah, he did believe there was this, this divine you know, realm and truth. But humans didn't have access to it. And so, you know, kind of like the theologians that came out around the death is God mo- death of God movement, where you had basically this so holy other that we just might as well stick to coming up with, you know, a God that works for us, kind of. It, well, I think that maybe we ought to stop here, Tom, and just address the death of God movement just briefly, because I think most of our listeners are probably uh, – when and when they hear about it, they they think about if any if you know anything maybe the cover of Time magazine that one issue with was just all black the death of God, but they often will have some kind of folk uh, sort of theolo- theological response that misses the point entirely and actually makes them look stupid when they say it. <laughs> so they'll say something like, 
well, how can God be dead? I just spoke with him this morning or something like that. (laughs) But, but they're, but, but what, what they're demonstrating uh, when they say something like that is actually kind of to the point of the death of God movement, which is that it's, you know, God is no longer a point of reference for a society to build its public life around. It's entirely a personal private matter between the individual and whatever, you know, he he or she is into when it comes to spiritual things. If you're into God, well, good for you. God can talk to you all day long. He's just not talking to the president, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, and it also misses what you were getting at with this, with, you know, sort of this radical transcendence uh, in which, uh, again, we're kind of getting back to a kind of theological relativism since well, we, god is so unknowable yeah. we can't we can't know anything about him what 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 are we to, what can we say about him yeah it's, it's it's interesting the um the connection there i mean that was something that in particular rotzinger was trying to address within the catholic tradition especially after vatican ii um his wasn't he wasn't as interested in the kind of death of god movement per se he was he was troubled though by dogmatic relativism in the sense of updating the language to the contemporary world. But that is very similar to the Death of God movement because the Death of God movement really took up something from Dietrich Bonhoeffer in a direction I don't think Bonhoeffer ever aimed um, to have it taken. And one of the things Bonhoeffer was saying is basically uh, Christianity has come of age. And and as he was watching the bombing of Germany and the elimination of, of Protestant or Christian culture, he knew that the 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 atmosphere was going to be not religious that filled it. So he was trying to conceive what shape would Christianity have if there are no forms um, anymore. And, and he was he was already addressing this when he he decided to act ethically against his his kind of Christian pacifism, which he he held for a long time. And he was basically saying, as one could be a Christian pacifist in a kind of world in which there was still some Christian form. But because that form is gone, he, he argued, basically he had to take a kind of severe action against Hitler and, and move towards a violent act, if you will, of trying to participate in the bombing of him to, to break that uh, heinous, murderous kind of uh, you know, politic. And so, but what he talked about is the way in which the world comes of age. And so, it basically, the secular society in which God is 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 absent to our everyday experience and reference. And so, what will Christianity look like? So, the death of God, picking up that kind of secular um, emphasis, couple that with kind of Nietzsche's point of basically um, we've killed we've killed off the the transcendent in the right sense of the word and. We've killed off the way that it 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 captures a culture and a society. So the art is dead. Everything's become bourgeois in their mind, you know, um, flat. And so it, it doesn't have the spirit, if you will. That was their kind of emphasis. And so they they're looking. They were looking for some some new pulse um, to give life to secular humanity. Um, who who uh, so anyway that was kind of a longer story but that was kind of what was up with that whole God is dead movement I, I think you could say Harvey Cox would have been someone who absorbed oh, yeah. a lot of that that uh, yeah, yeah. I knew Harvey Cox as you know yeah yeah that was his take yep yep scaling the secular city right it's, or 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 the secular yeah, uh, city yeah secular si- secular yeah Moreland's yeah. response to that was scaling the secular city yeah. Yeah, now, I hope you're going to go back in time a little bit because you jumped right over the early modern period where there's a lot of really important stuff going on. Yeah, and so uh, let me go back a little further, then I'm going to try to catch up to that. Maybe that's where we'll just kind of float around a bit. But Heraclitus, of course, and this is where we were talking about, you know, um, the metaphysical picture of relativism. And we're going to get this a lot, a return to this with Hegel. But, I mean, Heraclitus was in competition with his ideas with Parmenides. Parmenides was basically saying that our sense experience deceives us and that all appearance is really just transitory form, but what is real is that which is absolute and fixed. Um, And and then, um, then Heraclitus comes along and kind of reverses that. Everything is becoming. Everything is in a chain is in a state of change. So if you want to talk about what is fixed, it's fixed in, in, only in the sense that everything is becoming. It's kind of relativism as an on, ontology, if you will. Um, all is moving. Everything's fluid. 
Um, you can't step into the same river twice. You can't step in the same river once. Everything's in constant flux. That's kind of uh, the take there. And uh, the unity of opposites was another aspect of Heraclitus is that, that you could, and you see this with Hegel a bit later, where you can have something be true and its opposite be false. But in this case, the opposite is not, not truly false. It could actually be unified with that truth and come to a kind of higher kind of truth. Right, we'll get. We'll learn that we'll get this dialectical thinking with Hegel, where you can have a thesis, an antithesis, a new synthesis, and a continual kind of process. I'm simplifying there, but I'm, I'm trying to kind of just keep that. Um, but you, you had the um, uh, Sextus Empiricus, um, where you had the uh, the skepticism, and of course uh, the Peronian. Is that the right way of saying that? Peronian skepticism. Yeah, you can use either Peronian or Peronical. Yeah. So uh, all judgments and beliefs are to be suspended. Um, you get, well, of course, that we have the Renaissance, and maybe Glenn could talk a little bit about that, where you have the rediscovery of a wide variety of beliefs and practices of ancient times. And this actually starts to lead to a kind of criticism of ethnocentrism. Um, Vespucci, is that the name? Who Mundus Novus? Yeah. Yeah. So that was kind of one of the key works uh, that was already starting to challenge the kind of unified vision that a lot were aiming for um, in a lot of the yeah. Christian. Yeah, let, let me jump in here. During the Middle Ages, you get people like Aquinas, Albertus Magnus, and others who are trying to create a synthesis of all human knowledge. Yeah. Um, and they gave up because they realized it was impossible. And the net result is the late scholastics aren't trying to do sumai. They're trying to do what they called quodlibets, which is Latin for whatever. <laughs> um, these little short things focused on, on discrete topics. The people in the Renaissance rejected uh, the scholastics, arguably for some pretty good reasons, in, in some cases at least. But in the process, they tried to do these same kinds of grand syntheses of all human knowledge. The problem is they were also looking at human knowledge far more broadly. So it's no longer just the Greco-Roman and Christian tradition. We're bringing in Persian ideas. We're bringing in ideas uh, that were believed to go back to ancient Egypt, didn't really. We're looking at the Kabbalah. Um, we're looking at uh, Islamic culture. And the epistemological assumptions here essentially are, first of all, that uh, truth exists, that it's knowable to the human mind, um, and that, in fact, it's necessary. Uh, and by that, I mean that uh, a society that's not built on a solid grounding of truth is built on a lie and it can't survive. Yeah. yeah I think one of the things, though, before we move on, though, that it, it would be good to underscore in what you just said, Glenn, is that uh, these are people who are not operating from an ethnocentric outlook. Right. These are people who are saying we need all of the knowledge that the human race has acquired across the world, and we want to try to incorporate it into a single whole. Right. And that actually is, is the product of those epistemological assumptions, because any time you have a successful civilization, a civilization that lasts, the assumption is it has to be based on a solid foundation of truth. And the assumption that all truth is truth, I mean, you know, it means that all of these things can, in principle, be synthesized together. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you try to do it, it doesn't work. Well, what, what we have is what C.S. Lewis talks about a bit in uh, The Discarded Image when he's talking about the, the aesthetic of the medieval world, which was what he described as, as kind of cataloging. It wasn't uh, an attempt at sort of winnowing out things. It was it was a, an organizing a, a affair. How do we how do we have the, all this uh, sort of heterogeneous material to, to work with, all this heterogeneity? Uh, but we we believe that there's something valuable in all of it. Uh, yeah. So we don't want to throw any. It's like it's 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 just like uh, the hoarders television programs where you, you know somebody is like got a bunch of stuff in their house and they can't move around anymore because they 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 they, they value everything. So the, one one of the reasons why the you know the art of the Middle Ages is so 
uh, rich and variegated and has so many things going on in it that seem to be almost at odds with each other is because they're trying to fit it all together into some kind of harmonious whole. Yeah. yeah. Which is a very, a very noble uh, enterprise. Yeah. yeah. It, it, may be, it may be impossible, but at least they were, their hearts were in the right place. And let's give them credit. <laughs> yeah. But when you get to the Renaissance, it's even worse because they're actually trying to pull in things that were unknown to, to Thomas Aquinas. They're trying to bring in other cultures and things like that with the assumption that all of this stuff can harmonize. Yeah. So you get someone like Pico della Mirandola, the first, uh, who creates his 900 theses. Um, that's a synthesis <laughs> of all of these various things that he's brought together. And he challenges anyone to debate him on this. Uh, the problem, of course, is that the Inquisition in Rome read his theses and said, yeah, we would like to talk to you about this. I would think he decided that the air would be better in Florence when you left Rome. I mean, but... But the, the, ultimately, the Renaissance intellectual program, this is the thing people don't understand. The intellectual program of the Renaissance collapses under its own weight. Yeah. Because in attempting to create this kind of synthesis, in attempting to bring in the Hermetic tradition, which was, was believed to be ancient Egypt, and the Kabbalah, and Islamic sources, and Persian sources, and all these kinds of things, in the attempt to bring all of this stuff together, it demonstrated that their epistemology didn't work. Yeah. It, it created a crisis in epistemology because their goals, their assumptions, and all of that proved to be completely unworkable. And where do you go next? And this is one of the things that begins opening the doors to relativism. This is where Sextus Empiricus actually comes in. He's rediscovered in the Renaissance. It was actually his works were published by John Calvin's publisher. Ah, uh, no, that's <laughs> the, the irony there is he'd been kind of depressed and he read this stuff and he thought it was so funny. He published it, not realizing that he was laying a major landmine in the, in the middle of the European uh, intellectual tradition at that point. And, and, and so what you get here and you can start to see the, the kind of wide ranging floods of 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 episodes and sources that kind of bring about conditions for this and and also we've talked about enough the whole history of universals and nominalism um that came and where they basically got tired of of the, the focus on on the abstract and that which is lifted up and and the particular becomes um the focus of everything and it becomes in in the names we use for things start to become more conventional they're not tied to any higher um, order, any real um, universal order, but tied very much to the, the convention and and the distinct individual things. And so our names, no, no, four I, things. I, yeah, mm. yeah. I, I think I just I just want to interject here real quick here, Tom. Do you guys sense a kind of uh, change in the atmosphere uh, around some of these things? I, over the last five years, there's been a growing interest, I think, in the realist uh, legacy uh, and a growing, um, yeah. I think, uh, disillusionment uh, with nominalist uh, approaches, or the anomalous approach, historicism. Is, I think a lot of, I think we're kind of entering into a new crisis phase. Kind of, you know, you described a crisis occurred, yeah. you know, Glenn, uh, when, you know, the, the whole project of the, of you know late uh, the, the late mid medieval and, and the Renaissance agenda of trying to synthesize all knowledge fell apart. Now I think we have almost kind of the reverse. There's a crisis, and you and I'm I'm seeing it kind of com coming to the surface in unexpected places. It's not just in uh, Christian circles that we see people looking for uh, permanence and answers that yeah. are not just historicized. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, you're, I'm saying a flood of work being done now, even in the evangelical world, on you know, uh, the significance of the, the realist traditions, whether it's Christian Platonism, Aquinas, the significance of Aquinas, all this stuff starting to be retrieved, um, the significance of, of, of you know, the, the classic sources, um, the significance of addressing metaphysical issues beyond the, the kind of relative and historicist. Mm -hmm. So I, I am seeing it. Um, and again, I don't know what wider impact it's having, but I am definitely seeing uh, 
I'm seeing a, a readiness for it, even w- it within wider culture, where they see something's wrong, but they don't know what, and they're starting to be open to wisdom from from you know from these kind of sources. Um, one of the things that's interesting is is that um, the thing we didn't mention is worth mentioning, and I think this is something that I think that. that you know, Protestants in particular, but not only have to address, but it was with the, with the Reformation, you also had a kind of, a kind of relativizing, if you will, of Christianity, while all the Protestants were kind of jumping on board as scripture alone, um, it became, instead of sola scriptura, it became solo scriptura in many cases, and then what you have is a bunch of different Christianities, Right, and you see, even in the U.S., um, when you a lot of the early America, when a lot of the cults start to develop, one of the reason they started to develop um, Mormonism and some of the different varieties is because no one could settle on which one of these things was the genuine Protestant article or the genuine Christian article. Yeah, the the solo scriptura thing, at least in terms of a formal argument, actually dates to 19th century liberals. Hmm. This is one of the things that a lot of people miss. The reason why they wanted to go to solo scriptura rather than scripture read in the context of the the um, regular fide, the rule of faith. The reason they wanted to do that is they wanted to feel free to reject the Trinity, yeah. the incarnation, the resurrection, all of these kinds of things. Um, and still claim to be faithful to scripture. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so so that's where this the, the weird thing is that when we look at a lot of things that evangelicals tend to do, a significant percentage of them actually come out of liberal Christianity. Yeah. And you and I think you have similar with the Unitarian emphasis a, little, a bit earlier. It's because they wanted and, and they did recognize that they the, the there were on the dogmatic issues. There were conflicts that were not resolvable now because of a higher authority because everyone's pointing scriptures. It's just like the the early church when the heresies developed, right? They're all saying they come from scripture. Um, Arius mm. was not saying, well, you know, he was not arguing something else. <laughs> well, an example from from the uh, late 16th century is Fausto Susini, <laughs> uh, alias Faustus Sicinus, um, who in a colloquium, I believe it was held in Poland, uh, he, there were a group called the Josephites. The Josephites denied the virgin birth and believed that Joseph was Jesus's father. <laughs> and Socinus argued that on the basis of sola scriptura, we should accept them because the real issue for them is what was and was not scriptural. They had assumed that the passages on the virgin birth were interpolations. So they accepted as true everything that they believed was genuinely in the scripture. So therefore, <laughs> now, uh, Sozini um, was a Unitarian. Yeah. So you, you, you can kind of see how that, that fits in here. But you get these intellectual arguments going all the way back into the 16th century. And what you what you have, as you know, um, is the conflicts that started to arise from the you know the different confessions and the different politics wrapped around them, and the way in which the Enlightenment starts to 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 develop within the these conflicts, and they looking they are in some sense looking for a way to to have a public way of accessing something a society can share that isn't driven by all that confessional conflict and all of that relativity. So they do want to kind of uh, get a hold of uh, universal, and they want to have something that everyone can say, you know, say, okay, we can all share to to this. And so they, they looked for it, whether it was in a shared experience or shared reason, but the difference was this wasn't grounded in eternal, the eternal. This was grounded in the, the human subject. Um, and, and, of course, there is a way in which it's kind of indirectly grounded in the eternal because the way Descartes and, and Kant, they can be read as though consciousness is basically um, numerically identical with divine consciousness, if you will. We're just a kind of creaturely participation in it. Um, it, and so what, what we have here is with the Enlightenment, you start to, with Descartes, for example, grounding things in the cogito, the I think, therefore I am, even though he'll later argue for God as the ground of that, but it's, it's grounded first once he establishes that. 
what you end up doing is a, is a small move from um, everyone has access to truth individually through their cogito to my personal truth. It's not it's not a it's not a long set of steps, um, and you you will see eventually with Kant you will see the the notion of the way in which our categories in our mind are active, and they are shaping the the you know our experience to such we are forming and we're taking basically the intelligibility that used to be inherent in creation because god the mind of god if you will and now it's something we're imposing on things because of our own categories of understanding and and kant even sets the stage for that becoming uh relative in the sense that he will quantities for example will be to will be something imposed by each of us individually and differently. So you start to lose any kind of universal or shared rationality and interpretation. Um, so you, you start to see the, these, these threads develop. Um, later you'll have Hegel, who I think is, has infected the church in many ways. Um, and it's infected you know, his, certain kinds of historicism in which um, there, is, there is no way in which to really um, – empathize with the past in any strong way of connecting with it because the context, my context and that context are so different that we're only able to access it through our, our different uh, shapings and, and the, and the light. You wonder how much is incommensurable. You know? Yeah. You know, that's also Kuhn there, the incommensurability yeah. of paradigms. Yeah. So, you know, related to this is the, the, you know, the question of human nature, um, is human nature something uh, continually in flux or is, or is there some sense in which it's stable? Um, yeah. I think that uh, one other way that the instability is introduced to our thinking is through Darwinism. Uh, yeah. If, you know, the human, human, if human beings uh, had a, a radically different or sort of have, have ancestors that had a radically different nature, What's to say that, you know, in the past, uh, what's to say that our, uh, you know, descendants won't also be as radically different from us as, as uh, we are from them? And if that's the case, uh, what kind of uh, ability do we have to understand um, anybody uh, from another time? Uh, you know, in what you're getting at with kind of Hegelian thought there, Tom. Yeah. But I think... Uh, you know, you, you remember H.G. Uh, Wells and Time Machine. That it was kind of an exploration of the idea of what could become of the human race if sufficient time was, you know, given. You, you'd find that in the distant future that they would be very different than us. So, yeah. you know, the Eloy and the Morlocks are two uh, sort of uh, subsets or two sets of descendants that uh, both come from, you know, the people that we ha know today. Now, how does all of that relate to some of this uh, stuff related to relativism? Well, I think it's pretty clear that uh, things, uh, what's, what's, it's a different kind of approach or a different sort of outworking of uh, uh, kind of our uh, problems with epistemology. If, if hu the human mind is changing, uh, even just human, the human being is changing in such radical ways over time, then uh, you've got essentially this uh, – not just finite, uh, ration, you know, sort of rational creature. You have a creature whose rationality uh, has a very different character from time to time. Uh, and then how does that rationality uh, apprehend the universe? Um, and this also relates to the doctrine of, um, you know, Christ's human nature. I was just in, I was uh, leading a discussion on uh, the confession, the Westminster Confession of Faith this past Sunday in chapter eight. We're talking about Christ's human and divine natures. And my point uh, during that time was um, we live in a time where many intellectuals uh, from a wide range of disciplines have rejected the concept of human nature. We just, they just don't even believe it, that, that there is such a thing anymore. So what does that introduce into the Christian sort of way of thinking? Well, if we, if we buy into all that, um, then how can we, uh, say that we participate in Christ and Christ is in some sense participated in our humanity if there is no such thing really as a human nature. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Just some more wrinkles to this whole thing. Well, yeah. another thing that I would want to throw in that I think is really important is the idea of the fact value distinction. 
Yeah. Um, and I think this is, I'm not sure it's as true anymore of current college students, but up until a few years ago, this was so fundamental to the way they thought that it was really next to impossible to crack them out of it. Um, the idea was that um, there's a world of facts in which we can know things. Uh, this is typically stuff that's defined by science. But there's also a world of values, which is um, uh, I issues of ethics, issues of um, aesthetics, uh, issues of religion, spirituality, things that are not empirically verifiable or, or able to be studied by science. And in one case, you actually have knowledge. The word science is scantia in Latin means knowledge. Um, and in the other case, all you can have is opinion or faith or, or taste or something like that. And what that does is it takes everything that is not scientifically verifiable and makes it relative. Yeah. It does this yes. sort of instantly. And that was a consequence of stuff going on once again in the early modern period in the rise of modern science. I would say, Glenn, that, that science, uh, it, rather than seeing uh, kind of a scientistic approach uh, sort of bleeding into the humanities, what we have now is this radical relativism that's kind of backwashing its, its way into the sciences. Yeah. I, I, I'm very concerned not for uh, our inability so much to f sort of uh, identify values uh, as having some kind of objective status. Uh, in the short term, I'm concerned that people may no, may no longer be able to, to even add uh, or, you know, uh, do what yeah. we call science. Yeah. What's interesting is the reversal that took place. Um, not long ago, people were arguing for a scientific basis for taste, for aesthetics, for ethics, whatever. Mm -hmm. They were taking the, 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 what Francis Schaeffer called this upper and lower story thinking. The lower story is the world of fact. The upper story is the world of value. What they were doing is using the lower story to explain the upper story. Now we've reversed that so that the upper story is now cannibalizing the lower story so that, well, hypothetically, if you had someone coming up for a nomination before the Supreme Court and you asked this individual <laughs> to define what it meant to be a woman, yeah. they wouldn't be able to do that because ideology trumps fact. Yeah, that's, well. right. that's right. And okay. you might and you might even appeal to science in order not to have to answer the question. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, and that is the trick, the trick play going on for those that still want to have some kind of semblance of objectivity in, in the kind of contemporary, I mean, enlightenment form. They want it. They want to sound like they're being scientific. And, you know, I'm sure they're I'm sure their reference to biologists are very select, <laughs> like the ones that kind of. <laughs> yeah, I mean, trust, trust the science only applies in certain areas. That's right. And it, only it doesn't apply to defining male and female. Yeah, uh, it doesn't apply to when life begins that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and this is the kind of that kind of selectivity. But one of the things I mean, we could back up a little bit of uh, one of the cracks in the Enlightenment when it tried to really narrow that new human grounded rationality or or science was from uh, figures like David Hume. I mean David Hume likewise he he said basically it's not something that's a part of our experience causality. It's something we assume by habit because this follows this. So it's nothing we really know scientifically. So he starts to bring doubt into that kind of uh that kind of scientific reason but he sets up he breaks the, the like you said the is ought you know, he, he creates the is ought fallacy. Um, just because something is the case doesn't mean it ought to. And that gives kind of Kant later room to, to create two realms of, of, you know, two stories, if you will. But one of the things that he does, uh, Hume does is he said he basically relativizes all ethics. You can't develop ethics from necessarily what is the facts. And uh, and he want, he brings them to sentiment, which is not too far from feeling at the end of the day. I mean, I know he means something different, um, but uh, reason is not the source. Um, authority is not the source. But in, this puts an unbridgeable gap between the is and the ought, you know. And, and so, you know, as you said, facts and value judgments between the world of facts and, and feelings. And uh, and. Um, Basically, uh, Ratzinger's reply to that, and, and I got this from uh, Jankonus, his book on the dictatorship of relativism. Um, he says, basically what this did is it was a reduction of nature to facts, as you just said, um, 
you know, that can be grasped and controlled through, through instrumental reason, but can offer no moral message outside ourselves, right? So, so the facts can't, can't say anything. They can't speak because they're so severed off from um, any inherent uh, um, meaning and, and purpose and natures, as, as you said. So, I mean, Hume is already starting to contribute. Then we have a, I mean, I, a very interesting figure, um, Johann Herder, um, Herder, we owe a lot if you're, you're someone who likes languages and cultures and the stories of cultures. I mean, I think the, the work of Lewis and Tolkien was probably benefited by figures like Herder. I may be wrong, but it was the inspiration behind uh, Finland in getting its language back with the Kalevala and, and the like. It was the influence of Herder's kind of thinking there. Uh, but the danger is you end up with something like also similar to to uh, national socialism, this kind of reconstructed I, uh, idea and culture that says really um, there there isn't you know there there really isn't something that can really unify these things, um, and it really is going to be one or the other, or we come up with some way of of you know balancing the trade offs of living differently which I think is where we are very similarly, um, you know, we're, we're increased. But anyway, let me get, go down to this list that Jonkonos, um puts out there of the different forms that we start to see relativism today. And we've already talked about a few, but one would be the strong emphasis on context dependence. Um, and context is important. We have learned that from these figures. It is very important, but it's not everything. And when you understand there are real human natures um, and there is a real ontological and metaphysical order, then context takes on a different place rather than all determining place um, or only determining place. So context de dependence, uh, as he puts it here, is, is often argued that all our judgments and belief are context sensitive in that they always take place within a social and cultural framework and a background of both personal and collective assumptions interests and values and oftentimes can be wholly determined and influenced by them. There's something I'd like to just interject here uh, and it may surprise some people to learn but there has been a kind of paleoconservative case for multiculturalism and it's been around for a long long time and the idea is that through our various uh, traditions, uh, histories, there have been uh, points at which uh, there have been real breakthroughs uh, where reality has kind of broken through and uh, has given some character to a particular nation, tribe, history, culture, tradition that makes it valuable uh, and consequently should be honored as such. And it's, uh, you know, getting back to the earlier conversation, we, a point in the conversation where we were talking about the, the attempt to try to bring it all together, uh, some of these paleoconservative people like Russell Kirk uh, are making the case for kind of a uh, let's let's appreciate uh, each other <laughs> yeah. and, and recognize what, uh, you know, really has occurred in the past in, the, in these different groups that is, uh, yes, context dependent. It, 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 you're not going to be able to really appreciate, say, Dante if you can't read right. Latin or something, you know. Yeah. You know? But, um, but at the same time, uh, tapping into the universals, uh, not just history. Well, and I think that's why they become significant continuously. That's why we go back and study them, not simply to just encounter something foreign, although that's significant, but because there is something human there, there's something spiritual there, there, there is something um, we can know and learn. And, and um, there is something analogous is probably, I like an, an analogy better than, than even empathy. I think there's something analogous there because of, of the shared the share in being and the communication of being that 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 governs governs the whole of created time and space, and and I think that's a way there. So we can include context dependence, and actually it recognizes contingency, but it doesn't reduce the meaning just to the the contingent factors. That meaning is inherent on a on a on a transcendent level, even in dimension, even if it refracts in that in that. Uh, in that particular moment, time, message, story, place. Um, and so, but the other one that's tied to this, we hear all the time is perspectivalism, right? Um, going beyond 
context dependence. It's arguing that the truth of one's judgment is completely determined by your viewpoint, right? And so there is no ultimate viewpoint, no God's eye view, because all of our access to even that is is perspectival. And so we're we're kind of we're all locked in different perspectives. And and then as as what happens is this becomes a value judgment that all perspectives therefore need to be included in any true picture of things. And I think that's where an evaluative judgment is erroneous. Um, Yeah, we all come from different perspectives. We all have a different gift, if you will, and different shapings. But that doesn't mean that all those things, um, all all of what is determining one's viewpoint um, is opening it up to truth and meaning in any any, any way that we have to accept all of it. (laughs) Yeah, we can... can, uh, Reject the Aztecs and human sacrifice. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. We, we should probably wrap it up on that note. I yeah. think that's a good place to say that there really are things that are just true. <laughs> and, and there are things that are just wrong. But uh, anything you want to say, Glenn, as we close? Yeah, Francis Schaeffer had some really good practical ways of dealing with issues of relativism. If you read in his books, as he, he narrates some of his uh discussions with people. If you're interested in practical suggestions on how to deal with this, Schaefer is a really good place to begin. Um, So I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I've said everything I have to say. Uh, Anything you want to say as we wrap up, Tom? Uh, No, I think I wanted to kind of introduce the topic and I will get back to it. I think over the next few times when my show comes up, I want to think more about it and move towards some very practical ways um, I don't think the only way of, you know, of, of trying to address it is, is just, you know, preaching at it. <laughs> um, I think we can, we can come at it from a different ways. But I think one of the, the uh, points that, that each of the, the different theologians had made that were concerned about it is we need to start forming a kind of churchly consensus and cultural consensus to reject it and go at it and not let it get away with it what what it's doing it is it's destructive and it's it's something that doesn't have the right because it isn't connected to truth to hang around as though it has some bearing on it yeah i think that we as christians need to fight for the truth uh for a range of reasons and one of those reasons is love of neighbor Mm -hmm. and even love of those who are outside the christian faith yeah uh you know, I think that this idea that to be winsome, we just kind of keep our mouth shut and don't challenge stuff, or, or at least uh, only challenge things that are politically correct to challenge, which is what the winsome seem to, to think. Uh, I put winsome in quotes. Uh, but anyway, I think that we have a, a great task ahead of us, uh, and uh, we need to make some progress at a number of levels. And one of those levels is within the church itself. We got to cut out the nonsense and get to the task at hand. Anyway, thanks a lot, folks, for listening to the Theology Podcast. We appreciate your interest and support. We get gifts on a regular basis. Just got a note, a note today about a good-sized gift that came in, and we're really pleased to know that or hear that or receive that. And uh, we, we do appreciate uh, all of the gifts that, that have been brought and provided to us through various means. And I guess what, the last thing I'd like to say as we wrap up is uh, we're making a little progress toward uh, getting the uh, Southeast Tour uh, off the ground. And hopefully soon we'll have some things to share uh, that are um, concrete and, uh, and can help people, uh, I guess, uh, mark their calendars and look forward to it. Anyway, uh, that's enough for now. Uh, Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye now.